I've just had the pleasure of interviewing Professor Jeffrey Hinton, this year's Nobel Prize laureate in physics. He is here in Stockholm um, to receive his prize and we were thrilled to receive him at the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences to ask him a few questions about AI, the risks and opportunities, the importance of international collaboration and the prospects for the future. Professor Hinton, a warm welcome to the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences and congratulations on the Nobel Prize. Thank you. You've been working with artificial intelligence and perhaps more specifically with the development of neural networks for a long time, long before anybody else believed in them. What gave you the stamina, the grit to carry on? Actually, it's not before anybody else believed in them. So both von Neumann and Turing believed in neural nets. Mm -hmm. And they were actually quite good at logic, but they didn't believe in the logicist approach of having symbolic expressions in your head. They thought the key to intelligence was figuring out how neural nets could learn. But they both died young. And after that, AI was taken over by people who believed that intelligence must consist of having things like logical expressions in your head and using rules to manipulate them. And there were a few people, I was one of them, who still believed that the key was understanding how you learn the strengths of the connections in the neural net. Um, and the AI community was very strongly against that. They all said it was rubbish. But I had experience of that before. So my parents were both atheists and they sent me to a private school from the age of seven, um, which was Christian. And so everybody around me believed in God, the teachers and all the other kids. And I thought it was obvious nonsense. And it turned out I was right. So that was a very good experience for being in that same situation with neural nets later on. Very interesting. The importance of being shaped at a young age. Yes. Right? Moving on to international collaboration, I've spent 20 years studying and shaping international scientific technological relations, um, and as, as I'm sure you have also been involved in. And as researchers, you and I, we both know that international collaboration and a willingness to share knowledge are incredibly important for advancing science. How do you think the current global race in AI development will affect the global climate of research exchange and collaboration? So I think it depends which aspect of AI you're talking about. So for things like lethal autonomous weapons, which all the major arms countries are busy building, um, I don't know about Sweden, but certainly the US and Russia and China and Britain and Israel are all building lethal autonomous weapons, um, they're not going to share the technology. Um, for things like cyber attacks, they're all figuring out how to do cyber attacks, which they call defense. Um, I don't think they'll share much of that technology. Um, there is one place where they will share, I believe, mm -hmm. which is the existential threat, the threat that AI will get more intelligent than us and take over. Because there, all the different countries have the same interest. They don't want AI to take over. Mm -hmm. The Chinese Communist Party does not want AI to replace the Chinese Communist Party. Right. And so there we will get collaboration. Just as during the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the US collaborated on not having a global thermonuclear war, because it wasn't in either of their interests. And so I think we will see significant collaboration um, between different nations on the existential threat. That is very hopeful, especially in this age of increasing isolationism, that we can still count perhaps on that ration. People I'm being... hoping we can. Okay. <laughs> As an academy, one of uh, our most important goals or objectives is to promote, promote research and development in the field of technology. Experience tells us that a cornerstone for making progress and finding new opportunities is trial and error. Um, but you have previously said that AI development might be the first time in modern science that we cannot afford to move forward in this manner. What do you mean by that? Okay, so for much of AI development, we can afford to make mistakes. Okay. Um, and we can recover from them. But for the existential threat, the threat that these things will, when they're more intelligent than us, which most researchers think they will be, that they will then take over because we haven't figured out how to prevent them wanting to take over. Um, we can't really afford to make a mistake there. Once they take over, I don't think there's any going back. Mm -hmm. So we have to get that right first time. Right. And therefore also the importance of countries collaborating together on this existential yes. risk. Okay. And we have to put a lot of resources into that now. Right. So we know if there's anything that can be done to prevent that, it would be a shame if we didn't do it. Yes. And the resources need to be put in by governments? The people who have the computational resources are the big companies. Right. At present, governments aren't willing to allocate that much money. Right. 
And you could imagine something like CERN with funding of, like, say, $100 billion yes. that could do that research. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, particularly because there's this competition between countries. Yes. So I think what has to happen is that governments force the big tech companies to spend a significant fraction of their computing resources on AI safety. So um, maybe to finish, hopefully, on a, on a, on a slightly optimistic note, I, I'd like to ask you, for somebody who's been working in this field uh, for as long as you have, uh, when you look at the young generation today, which is dealing with a lot of sort of clouds on the horizon, what would be your advice or your words of wisdom to them? So I think there's two things I'd like to communicate. One is don't believe people who say the existential threat is just science fiction. Mm -hmm. It is a very real threat. These things are genuinely intelligent and they're going to get more intelligent. And they understand the world and understand language in much the same way as we do. Um, so that's something we've never dealt with before. And there is, there's going to be all sorts of serious issues with that. So don't believe there's no problem, but also don't believe it's hopeless. Mm -hmm. We have no experience of this. We are the people constructing them. We have a lot of power at present. And if we can figure out a way to construct things that they never want to take over, we'll be okay. But once they're more intelligent than us, if they ever want to take over, we're done for. So I think at present we're a bit like someone who has a really cute tiger cub as a pet. Now, if you can guarantee that it never wants to kill you, fine. Um, but you better sort of work hard on that now. Thank you so much. Well, that is uh, not wholly optimistic, but it's something that I think engineers in the Royal Academy of Engineering Sciences can work with. Okay. Thank you so Good. much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.